Mystical Ninja starring Goemon is a game that I grew up with. It's a game that only I among my friends seemed to have, while nobody else had a clue about what it was or that it existed in the first place. Recently over the course of a few evenings, I went on a nostalgia trip. While I was expecting to turn the game on and turn it off again after an hour or so, I actually ended up playing through the whole damn thing. So that leaves the question. Was Mystical Ninja starring Goemon a good game? Let me take you back to my childhood. My mother and I walked into one of those little game dens that are more or less extinct these days, at least as far as Sweden goes. I probably walked around and pointed at all the games that I wanted, Donkey Kong 64, Majora's Mask, Ocarina of Time, you know, all those $60 games. My mother, however, with a keen eye and a tight grasp around her wallet, spotted another game. She was always one for the colorful, happy-go-lucky stuff, so seeing a character with insane blue spiky hair must have grabbed her attention. That or the $20 price tag. Either way, that's what she ended up getting for little old me. You remember what it was like getting a new game as a kid, right? You would open it in the car, flip through the manual, and you could barely contain yourself. All you wanted to do was get home and pop that sucker in. Not like it is these days, where we're all adults with enormous Steam libraries full of games that we've never even installed. Either way, I got home, booted up the old 64, and was greeted by the majesty that is the intro to this game. Before I started playing through the game again, I actually started off by just listening to the soundtrack. It is one of the most charming things to ever grace my ears. Besides, I don't think I had ever heard lyrics in a video game before playing this. I mean, yes, the lyrics are in Japanese, but they are lyrics nonetheless. That on its own made me excited to see what it had in store. Pretty quickly I realized that what it had in store was a lot of reading, and a heavy reliance on your ability to remember the information that you acquire. I cannot pinpoint exactly how old I was when I played through this the first time, but I do know that I did not speak English and I might not even have been able to read. This was a problem of course, so I actually ended up playing through the game together with my mom. She did the reading and I did the gaming. This of course has impacted the nostalgic value of the game to me. It wasn't only playing a game as a kid, it was spending quality time with family while doing what I loved. Other than all of that, I didn't remember so much of the game. I remembered some stuff very vividly, but there wasn't a lot. I remember climbing Mount Fuji, I remember that there was a mechanical ninja who was my favorite character. I remember that there were these weird robot segments, but most of all, I remember that I just absolutely loved it. Before I start talking about my recent playthrough, I would like to clarify that I will not spoil any of the major story elements. What I will do, however, is talk about locations and abilities unlocked throughout the game, so this is your very mild spoiler warning. Remember what I said earlier about the soundtrack being the most charming thing ever? Well, that can be said about more or less everything else in this game as well. The characters, the enemies, the completely out of place laugh track that plays during comedic segments. All these cogs fit in perfectly to create this world that you just want to find out more about, spend time in and explore. Every time you see a new enemy you are struck with a what the hell is that or a man that's cute, I wonder if it explodes. The different characters who are major in some way to the plot all have a real personality which sets the game apart from many other games from its time. Even if they are villains you can find yourself rooting for them just to see them more on screen. Even though Goemon is featured heavily in the name and is alone on the box art, you actually get to play four different characters with different abilities throughout your journey, starting off with Goemon and Ebusumaru and unlocking Sasuke and Yae later. Each of these four characters feel very unique, not only because of their different abilities but because of their vastly different personalities. While Goemon is obviously represented as the hero character, he also seems to be a bit of a goofball who just happens to find himself in these situations. Ebusumaru is the clown of the group, the comic relief if you will, even in his animations. Look at this flamboyant boy run. Yae is actually more or less the leader of the group. She takes everything a little bit more seriously than the rest of the gang, often reminding them that there is a mission to be done. Sasuke actually bears resemblance to that other Sasuke, you know the one, Mr. Edgelord over here. He was created by a character by the name of Wise Old Man, who the villains of the game allegedly killed. So he joins the party looking to avenge his fallen creator. He's basically the cool kid of few words that the player can easily project themselves onto. The game starts off in what I can only assume is Goemon's and Ebusumaru's hometown. The two are being kicked out of a restaurant because Ebusumaru took all of his clothes off and did his... uh... dance? A spaceship then appears in the sky and floats over the village. We get a little peek at our mustache twirling villains who then shoot a laser at Oadeo Castle, 
or the Lord's Place, turning it into a much more western looking castle. Goemon then tells Ebusumaru that they can't just stand around, and so the adventure begins. As you might be able to tell, this game does a great job at not taking itself seriously, and it works so much in its favor, the plot is absolutely the best part of the game. It is completely over the top, funny as all hell, and just an all around good time. Every time I felt a cutscene coming on, I always got super excited to see what else they had up their sleeves. It is stupid, and I love it. Which is why I won't talk about it. The plot alone is enough of a reason for you to play through it yourselves. The game takes place all across Japan, which is great because it gives us a lot of variety. Naturally, everything is inspired by Japanese culture, but we get everything from sandy desert to snowy mountains. However, it is also where my first criticism of the game comes in. The way the different areas connect to one another is pretty strange. I generally don't have problems finding my way around a place when I've been there before, but with this game I often found myself scratching my head as to where I should be going. Even if I'm told to go back to a town that I visited before, and I have a clear memory of what that town looked like, it's the getting back there that can get a little confusing. This would have been a much bigger problem for me though if we didn't get the quick travel alternative a few hours in. It helps tremendously with the weird layout of the world. That being said, it only helps to a certain degree, and I would still find myself lost on occasion. As for the actual gameplay itself, it's a mix between a 3D platformer and an action-adventure game, leaning a lot more heavily on the latter genre. You could of course draw a lot of similarities to the likes of Zelda, since you run around an overworld and occasionally enter dungeons finding items that help you progress. My favorite being the sushi submarine. Man, this game is just so Japanese, it's great. You switch characters with the push of a button, making the gameplay experience feel pretty versatile, since each character has their own gimmicks. Goemon wields a regular pipe as his short range weapon, a golden pipe that can extend and be used as a grappling hook, and he can also go Super Goemon, which gives him the strength to move heavy objects. Ebusamaru wields a meat club that can turn items into food and act as a weapon, a camera that can show hidden items around the world, and he can turn small to get through tight spaces. Yae wields a saber as her weapon, a flute that can be used for quick travel, and she can turn into a mermaid opening up new areas in the latter portion of the game. Sasuke wields ninja kunais as both a short range and a long range weapon. The long range version doubles as a way to freeze certain blocks. He can also use a jetpack to reach high places. While you do have to switch characters to progress through the game, I still ended up picking a favorite and mainly used Sasuke once I got him unlocked. Something about being a mechanical ninja man, it's just... Okay, okay I'm, I'm a big child, I know. There are also these moments when the team takes control of a giant clockwork robot by the name of Goemon Inpakotu, or Impact for short. The song that plays during these segments is hands down the best track in the game. I mean, imagine if at the end of a Super Smash Bros conference, they're all like, but wait, there is one more thing we want to show you. I would shit myself, but that's probably just a Goemon fan in me. The robot segments start out by you controlling impact from a third person perspective, breaking everything in your path which increases the amount of health you will have in the first person battle segment. These are actually a lot of fun. I remember getting super stuck here as a kid, probably took me weeks to beat this first boss, but it turns out that they are really rather easy when you get the hang of the controls. It's still tons of fun though. The weakest point in the gameplay is probably the platforming. Not because it's poorly designed or anything, but because we don't get any camera control at all. I know we're dealing with the very early days of 3D gaming here, but if Super Mario 64 could have camera control two years before this game came out, I kind of feel like they should have been able to implement something. I mean, I would have been happy to just have the ability to center the camera behind me in the likes of Ocarina of Time. This is probably my biggest problem with the game. It is the thing that got on my nerves more than anything else, but with a little patience, the camera centers behind you automatically. I guess you just get a little irritated as an adult when you have to wait for something, when the world around you seems to be moving at light speed. It just gets frustrating when it feels like it's not your inability to play or be good at the game, but it's the game's inability to keep up with you. I mentioned earlier that the layout of the map can be a bit confusing. Well, this is also partially because a lot of the time the game isn't super good about letting you know what you're supposed to be doing. Every now and again you'll get done with an objective and get that dreadful sensation of, what now? While I generally try to figure it out on my own, I did end up bringing up a walkthrough three, maybe four times throughout the game. This made these segments less painful, but I'm pretty sure that if I had not brought up a guide during these moments, it would have greatly diminished my enjoyment of the game. The developers also realized this, that maybe it can get a little tough keeping track of it all, so they included the best character in the game, by the name of... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Plasma or Pirasima is a fortune teller that will point you in the right direction when you get lost. While this can certainly be helpful, it can also be a little vague at times, and this is generally when I had to bring up the guide. 
No, it wasn't good. It was great in 1998 when the game came out. When I played this as a kid, there was no question about this game being great, and my love for it was completely justified. But it's not 1998, it's been 21 years, so does it hold up today? Yes it does. The plot really drives this game home and staples it as a hidden gem for the N64. If you enjoy Zelda, Banjo-Kazooie, Mario 64, or you just really enjoy the Nintendo 64 as a whole, then I think that you should, without the shadow of a doubt, play this game. I cannot say that there was ever a moment when I full on wanted to turn the game off in frustration, or that I ever got bored with it. I had tons of fun throughout the entire playthrough. I'm even willing to overlook the camera issues since the rest of it holds up so well. Now, what I would really like to see though is a remake, or a brand new Goemon title in the same style. But seeing as Konami published this, uh, well, I very much doubt that we will ever see another Goemon title with the last one being released for the Nintendo DS in 2005. I'm actually very happy that I took the time to sit down and see this thing through to the end again. And I'm hoping that you will too. Thank you for stopping by. Odd out.